like. And this is the picture you will see me paint from the first stroke to the finishing touches. The accompanying leaflet will help you follow my progress. I really have aimed most of my instruction to procedure and painting techniques, knowing full well that the painting process is far too complicated to try to cover in one painting session. Before I uh, go into doing, talking just about still life, may I acquaint you with the painting components that paint any picture, whether it's a still life, a portrait, or a landscape. Every picture has a composition, which is the arrangement of the subject on the canvas. The composition is uh, further defined with drawing, which is the structure and proportion and perspective at which you look at the, at the composition. Tone, light and dark, gives dimension to uh, the subject, and color certainly adds luminosity. The paint itself and its rhythm of application suggested by the object's forms gives a quality or a personality to the picture. And every picture has edges found, sharp, such as this, lost, such as this. These found and lost edges help present the dimensional quality on this flat surface in that sharp edges project and uh, fuzzy edges recede. Before we go to my easel, I would like you to uh, get a glimpse of the subject matter that I refer to. This is the still life arrangement. I arranged my lighting to come from the left, the all important lighting. Since paint is a physical substitute for the effect of light, I will be putting my paint onto the canvas the way the light is shining on this subject. The subject is made up of reflective and non-reflective objects, such as the bottle, highly reflective, the grapes, not so reflective. I will be painting reflective objects pretty much by focusing my attention on highlights and reflections. But on non-reflective objects, such as the crock or the apples, I will be doing them primarily in body tones and body shadows. Now, finally, let's go to my easel. I'm going to do a tonal underpainting uh, with, a, with acrylic. I have black and white, and I'm going to be mixing tones of gray to uh, lay in a whole foundation for my subsequent uh, applications of oil. But why don't I start right out and show you how I always approach a composition, and that is organizing the size of the entire subject on the size canvas that I have. Actually, I only know four things about this canvas. That's this side, this side, this side, and this side. And so I want to make this fit on that. So that's where I start. I don't start in, I start from the out and work in. So I'm going to say, I don't want that apple to be any closer to the edge of the canvas than there. And the uh, tip, the right, is uh, that little tip of the lemon. And I don't want that any closer to the edge of the canvas than there. Of course, this is how, how, how I want it, how I think it's going to look nice. So one of the things that I think is important to have things look nice is not to have this distance and this distance equal. Then I don't want anything to go out of the canvas at the bottom. And so I'm going to make a whole mark down here. And I think the tallest thing is going to be the bottle, and that's going to be up about in here. So those are easy decisions to make, much easier than trying to draw each one. Really, it's so much better to find out where you're going to draw, and that is really the, the function of the placement stage of composition. Now let's zero in on this overall arrangement and uh, not even draw, just still see if we can organize. So uh, maybe this blob of, of uh, shape could indicate the apple and the lemons, and then a shape here to a size, not a shape, but a size to indicate the little copper thing, and the apple, and then I have the jug uh, pretty much in here, and then I can feel that the grapes are going to be here, and the apple is going to be here, touching that which I had decided before. And then the bottle is going to be tall right about to here. 
And so these are just indications as to where I'm going to aim my paint to indicate the drawing. Many people are afraid to do this because you're afraid to, you're going to wreck the canvas, but you have nothing to lose at this point. So why don't I do, why don't I make a few more marks just to give me a feeling of security. Uh, it's uh, important to know what you're doing at the time and feel that you can do it. And so why don't I say, this is going to be the bottom of the apple. Where is the bottom of the bottle in relation to it? Where do the grapes come in relation to that? Where is the, the bottom of the... <clears throat> of the stone crock in relation to these things. Painting or drawing is not looking where you're going. It's, uh, it's, it's looking where you've been. And so these things can be a help to the final effect. So many people feel as though they have to be fantastic at drawing, but you can learn to draw or learn to draw better if you realize that there are uh, three factors to drawing, proportion, perspective, and anatomy. Now, proportion is really, I always say first, because it is the most important. If you get the size relationship of one thing to another, you can then have an overall uh, plausible look. Surely the, le the size of this lemon that I'm sketching in now has to be the right size in relation to the apple. And so this is just a little bit more of a development of the composition down and through here. I think maybe also you might have noticed, or I'd like to draw, point out to you, that I have everything either not touching or completely overlapping. It's never a good idea to have just things touch. Because if I had this apple, here I have a shape. That's going to be the side of the copper pot. If I had that apple right here touching it, it would look as though it wouldn't be in back of it. So to make it look as though it's in the back, to give that beautiful depth dimension, we just make sure they either move them apart or overlap them. Now the height of the bottle and the anatomy. Now I'm in the drawing stage. The composition is pretty much settled. Now I'm in uh, getting the, the uh, structure of them. And the anatomy is uh, recognizing the anatomy of a subject is uh, the key to getting it to look sensible. An apple is a little round shape, and it has a little hole in here, which is kind of a little inverted cone. You see, it's really this, with a stem sticking out, but it's infinitesimally small. So knowing basic shapes is very important. Now, the proportion of the bottle and, of course, the bottle's anatomy is that it is, has, it's a straight line, and then you just have to draw equally on either side, taking into consideration the, the, the elements of its shape. It has a top section, a neck section. I call this the shoulder section, and then the easy part. Now we have the bottle, the, uh, st uh, the stone crock in relation to it. It's, again, behind it. And it's going to be about in here. And the bigger part of the shape first to then find the smaller part of the shape. Of course, the handle is, is of no consequence now, because that's not, that, that was, it's, that can always be added later. Now I'm going to have a chance, I hope, to decide exactly where this apple's going to go. Yes, right about here, maybe here, and I'm going to make this a little smaller. And the height of it in relation to what I've already done is here. And so this is going to be the little copper pitcher. Then reiterate with a few lines uh, to give me a sense of security for when I'm going to actually paint this. This is where its little blossom end is, or no, stem end. And then the anatomy of the lemon. Yes, I see it flop down, and so the top plane gets quite a bit smaller because of perspective. Now, perspective distorts the proportions of things, and so proportion can help you with perspective. Because if you know the size relationships of one thing to another, you almost automatically get the perspective. 
a fringe benefit. Now, I do think that I have to uh, do something about this and make it an interesting shape of grapes. They're going to come in front of the, app, of the bottle, and then it's going to have this frontal part, then a part that jumps up here, and then a stem. And charmingly, I do see them through the bottle, which I'd like to take into consideration. Not that I'm actually painting it now, but I, I'm putting it in my memory bank for, for later on. Realize that the beginning of a picture looks like a beginning. It doesn't look like the end. And so I do want to show that the person didn't drink all the wine. And now I want to establish the uh, vertical plane and the horizontal plane. Many people start with that. I always do it in relation to my arrangement. This is the one place I would not have it, right here, right on top of that apple, because it will look as though the, the table is, is, well, the apple's holding up the table. It has to intersect at a planar place. Many people are afraid to make these big, bold lines, but painting is a matter of uh, seeing something. You can't correct it until you've done it. And they say that a painting is a record of a series of corrections, so you visually and artistically respond to this to then see how it looks. So make it bold right from the start. There's no, there's no reason for fearing the, uh, uh, the, the, the blank canvas in the beginning. You will fear it if you think as though it, it's the, the beginning, as I said before, has to be the end. Now the progression of application of just the values of these subject, this subject, it seems the practical way to do the background, the jug, the bottle, and so on as, until I come to the foreground. I've mixed black and white acrylic to fill in the darker background. Again, this beginning is done not for any other purpose to serve the next stage of the picture's development. You will see in the progress of this picture how beneficial this tonal evaluation of the colors will be. I don't want to get ahead of myself. I would rather talk about what I'm doing as I do it. And I would like to say that I do have a, a policy uh, about doing large areas. And that is, my stroke rarely gets much longer than an inch and a half. Big, bold things like this don't really look as atmospheric and represent air as much as little strokes no longer than an inch and a half. The value of the jug in relation to the tone that I've just used is lighter. And I'm already doing something that is a basic technique of mine. And that is that the first thing I paint in I paint in bigger than it is, so the next thing I do can cut into it. Now I'm filling this side of the jug in with a darker tone because this is where I see the body shadow. I'm also going to make this darker because this is going to be the cast shadow from it to help it look as though it takes up some space on the canvas. And I'd like to get the background darker here and darker here. Why? Because I think it's going to look better. Change of value in background can really only ever touch the subject or touch the edges. If, for instance, I do this, that distracts from the overall composition, because that's a change of tone that is not 
touching the subject or touching the edge of the canvas. I am going to mush that lighter tone in over here, though. Why? Well, that is really where the background gets lighter, because that's where the light is going. The light's coming from the left, hitting these, and on its path, making this the lightest part of the background. Because I really don't just paint that dumb drape that's behind my subject. I'm really painting the air that is wrap wrapped around the arrangement. And the bottle is made up pretty much of just reflections, not really having any tone of its own. So I think it'd be better just to take it out. for over there. And I'm going to destroy that edge because, as I said, I think that that would be more a problem of subsequent stages of the picture's development than right now. If you think of the simple steps, just like walking a thousand miles, you got to do it a step at a time. You can't make it one great big giant step. But it's sometimes kind of hard to find a beginning. But a beginning in painting is always the arrangement of the values that are contrasting each other to make the shapes. Yes, it looks as though these grapes are a very light color. And we think of them as light. But in this situation, they are darker than the crock. Very often, preconceived ideas of what we think the object is like robs us of a chance to record it as we see it at that particular time. Yes, the liquid in here shows up to be darker. The apple shows up dark on that side, plus it's cast shadow. There's a shadow here where this bunch of grapes uh, recede back. There's a cast shadow from the grapes over here. This apple records light because it's in the dark situation of the cast shadow from the jug. I work, I do my underpainting in acrylic because it's fast drying. It also covers much more substantially than oil. The old masters used uh, tempera for their underpaintings. Acrylic in the 20th century is the substitute or the replacement of, acryl of, of tempera. That's too light. I seem to be running out of my black. Let me replace some. So many people who have seen me demonstrate are shocked at the fact that I start this way. So many people think that color is, is, is what builds a picture. Of those six components that I talked about before, color is the one that is inconsequential. It decorates. It does make picture look luminous, but it does not really show the drawing, and it doesn't show the dimension. The tones do. And the contrast of values also determine a, an, uh, a picture's composition, the all-important composition. And again, I have cast shadows here 
from these. Try to initiate this very broadly. Not any uh, detail. After all, detail is the development of a larger mass. So I put the larger masses in first and, and refine it. But I would say that everyone is kind of stuck with his, his own um, paint writing, like we're stuck with our own handwriting. Some people are very neat, and some people are maybe are have a tendency to make a looser interpretation. It's a matter of thinking of what's important at that particular time. And to me, this picture's overall composition and its placement on the canvas is more important than anything else. I can develop all the anything else's in the next stages. Because I have to see how it looks. Then if I see how it looks and I think it looks all right, I can go back and fix it up a little. Maybe lighten this. I want to have a chance to make a beautiful outline of the bottle, so maybe I'll, I'll take away that. In the beginning, I like to keep all these shapes very vague. Because after all, it's just a foundation. I always call an underpainting under like a foundation garment <laughs> makes you look better in the end. <laughs> and surely a smaller brush would be the handier implement to zero in on this object's shape. This has to have a little indication of its stem end. This is such a complication over here where this uh, uh, lemon is sliced. For me to have a lot of activity in my underpainting now almost would be a hindrance rather than a help. So I think I'm going to uh, decide to take it out and put more of the copper pot in and make believe it's not hard, it's just hardly there. Painting is just a matter of figuring out a way to make it easy. So you can see that I can now that I know the size that the <clears throat> whole bunch is going to be, I can then divide the bunch into, into grapes. Because before, I couldn't think of the bunch and the grapes at the same time. This is also a beautiful section that I want to do as well as possible, where the grapes are going to encounter the, the jug. And so I'm going to not have the, 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 uh, that shape in at all, so that I can move those up against the jug. Now 
now this total evaluation of the arrangement and the subjects of the arrangement could also be done in oil in thin washes of, let's say, uh, burnt umber for where you see it dark and leave the uh, light canvas wherever you see it light. I like this uh, uh, way of this approach because it substantiates my color. Two coats are always better than one, especially when you're working in oil because oil paint does, is not as masculine a medium as many people think. So this represents step one. And what I have done is to review. First, I made these, this, these marks, which I call the envelope, that situates the subject on the canvas. Then I started to make a lot of lines to help me get the feeling of the object's proportions in relation to each other and uh, their anatomy. And then I started to record the lights and darks caused by the light coming from the left shining over to the right. We'll be ready to do the next stage as soon as this acrylic underpainting dries. Since my acrylic underpainting will take about 10 minutes to dry thoroughly, I thought I'd take this time out to introduce you to my palette. The leaflet has all the color names listed, so I can talk only about the palette's function, a very important one. Many people think that a palette is just a mixing place. I think of it as a thinking place. Paintings are made of shape, tone, and color. The tones and colors are what I decide on my palette and then let my brush worry about the shape. I am left-handed, I guess you've noticed, and so I set up my palette backwards. I read from right to left in that I put my white, a lightening agent, at this end and go all the way over to here to black, a darkening agent, although I don't use it for that purpose. I use it primarily mixing it with white to make tones of gray. I then add a warm color into these grays to make the gray warm, or a cool color into the gray to make it cool. There are only six colors, yellow, orange, and red, violet, blue, and green, but they have, they vary in three ways. Tone, light or dark, intensity, bright or dull, and hue, which is the particular quality of each color, yellow being maybe greenish or yellow being kind of orangey. And so I have on my palette the three warm colors, yellow, orange, and red, in bright versions, in dull versions, in even darker dull versions. The cool colors are here, grouped together, violet, blue, and green, in rather dark forms, but quite bright. So I find that I can conclude a successful mixture by asking four questions. For instance, this, I ask myself, what color is it? It's yellow. What tone is it? It's rather light. What intensity is it? It's not too bright. And what is its particular yellowness? It is maybe more orange than green. And so I take white for its lightness, a medium yellow for its color and intensity, and darken it or orange it with a little bit of burnt umber. And so I quickly ask these four questions before I start mixing a color and then see how they compare. So now it's time to go back to my easel and continue this picture in oil, in color. Now I start out with the background and I'm gonna take, I'm gonna make the background brown, which is a greenish brown, which is a version of yellow. So I've taken burnt umber and a little sap green and I'm going to see how this looks. Yes, I think that's kind of a rich color, although you have to put it down to see uh, if it's going to work. And I did put this down and saw it in relation to this color of the copper, and maybe it's not going to contrast enough, so I think I'll make it a little greener. Yeah, that's better thin the paint a little bit more so that it 
flows on better. I don't know whether you, uh, <clears throat> I would like to tell you that it's a great joy to put this dark color on a toned canvas because this color on a white canvas wouldn't look as rich. When I thin the paint this much, I do use my painting medium, which is, its formulation is on the folder that you have. And maybe you see uh, some streaks as I work. I see them too, but I'm not gonna worry about them. I want a smooth background, but I, can't lay in the color. Why don't I go right into that bottle with the color of the background, see, since I see that through the bottle. <clears throat> I can't lay in the color that I want and get the appearance of the color I want in one application. Painting in oil is an inf important way of being able to handle oil paint well is to recognize its limitation. Don't expect it to do a wonderful thing all at once. You have to work into it. Whoops. I should have my easel more sturdy. If ever you get a glare as you paint, tilt your canvas forward. Don't spin the, the, uh, the, the easel around and around. Just tilting it towards you will be the solution to that problem. Now I want to make, make it have a given an effect, and so I have a brush that is softer. Would you believe I, this is a hockey brush. All my brushes are also listed in that pamphlet. This is a hockey brush, but I have a, I call it a poopsie doo brush. People say, what are you doing now? I said, so I'm just poopsie dooing along, trying to make that background talk to me and say I look decent. And this slopping in, the vernacular is not that fancy, but the slopping in of the background color on the edges of that jug and on the edges of the copper pitcher will help me execute those found and lost lines. I am now going to start the development of the jug. <clears throat> Its color is yellow, its tone is light, and the yellow is a low intensity yellow. And so I'm going to use this low intensity yellow and lighten it with white. Why don't I clean off a mixing place? I'll take the white first, put the yellow into it, and see how it looks. Actually, I feel as though it's too bright, and so I'm going to dull it with a dark, duller yellow, burnt umber, and I've come up with this. And that seems like it is a good basic color. I'm going to take another brush and mix the shadow color because this is a non-reflective object and is usually, I usually paint non-reflective objects with two tones the body tone, and that's where the light strikes, and the body shadow, that's where the light cannot strike. I am mixing a violet, the complementary color to yellow, and I'm gonna try that out here. I think I'd like it darker. That's better. And so, this pole I have in my hand is called a mall stick. It's gonna steady my hand as I go. Steady as we go.
I have a filbert bristle brush which is a brush that's set flat at the furrow but comes to a edge. And so that's where the body tone is. And now I'm going to cut the body shadow into that. There's a feeling of a, I think I'll make it look as though it, the cork isn't there. The cork that is in it is not a nice looking cork. Well, that little top sets within the fatness of this, and so I make this come down further, and then make that go in back of it. Right there, leaving a lost line. This cylindrical top is casting a shadow. on the top. <clears throat> a little bit of light is falling around it. So I think I mentioned earlier in my painting demonstration that the first thing I do, I paint in bigger than it really is so the next thing can overlap it. And so why don't I put this whole body tone in going over the edge of the bottle because that's going to go in later. And I'm going to put that, sh that in deeper also than I actually see the shadow. I don't like that brush I chose for the shadow color. I would rather use this one, one with a flat end. The other one had a, is a filbert. And so this is the shadow color. Thicker, more of it, so more, mix more of it. And let me now put in the shape of the shadow on this non-reflective object. As soon as you find that your brush, your brush doesn't slip along the, the canvas easily, use a little bit more mi medium. And now here is the all-important turning edge, which is fundamental about non-reflective objects. This right here. This is the part that seems to be so difficult for the beginner painter where you want these two to blend together. Well, here's my way of doing it. I take a darker version of the body tone, less white in my mixture. I have this. And I make teeth. I'm trying to blend those two together. So I blend them together with a continuous wiggle stroke. And now, fuse them. A big blender or just a large brush is very helpful at this point. I would like to now carry extend the progression of this or the appearance of this uh, jug a little bit further by putting the color back into the shadow. See, I have yellow. I've turned it into shadow with violet. Now with a darker yellowish orange, I'm going to put color back into the shadow <clears throat> to stop the shadow from looking like a vacant area of illumination. There's always enough reflected light in the room to put color back into a shadow. And because I want the interpretation of this subject to be a little bit mysterious there, I'm going to take my background color on this bigger brush and obliterate that line. Actually, I think this is the beautiful part 
The more mysterious you make your shadow areas, the more beautiful the illuminated areas will be. Big areas, big brushes, small areas, small brushes. A small brush would never be able to give you the solidity that this application with this larger brush does. If you just slide down between the body tone and the body shadow with a more intense color, you can affect a blend. I think it's kind of important right now to <clears throat> suggest the beginning of the structure of these handles. Well, it's here where there's a raised part of crockery and uh, there's a raised part of crockery over here. And I would like to make, I line one up with the other. It shows here. You can see where all the little details are better added to the basic structure than rather to include it because it gives you a chance just to make your paint neat. I would say, if you can't be arty, at least be neat. Make the paint look decent. And this is a cast shadow from that handle. You can see that when I do any of the painting that brings out the form very distinctly, I'm using a sable brush. I feel as though this is about as much as I'm going to do to the jug, and the natural progression seems to be that I should do the bottle. Now, I'm going to start painting the bottle, and I'm going to look for all the colors that I think are part of the back part of the glass. And so I see the crock, which I'll make out of, start with crock color, add green to record this part. Actually, I think that I should use more green. It looks too light. That's better. And so, looking through the front part of the glass, I'm recording the color that is the back part of the glass. Yes, that shape becomes fused, and it slides up here. And I see a slight light reflection. There, the green looked too light. I added black. Ah, that's better. To suggest the other side of the bottle, that seems to be lighter right here on this corner. Let me get in front of it a minute. That's it. The thing that intrigues me about the bottle is all the things that are seen through it in a distorted way. The, the um, stone crock. And then I see the table, white tablecloth reflected in it too, or back there. And it's enlarged. It, the table line is here, but this is kind of enlarged here, slightly. And delightfully so, I see the grapes through. The bottle.
when you have a set up of still life subject matter look for the things that you think are lovely looking and make an issue of those if something doesn't look lovely just forget it make believe it isn't there but I do want to show the liquid and I think in terms of slices or planes, but why don't I talk about that when I do the copper? Uh, I see the top plane of the liquid, and this is a grayish red. I have to cut into that uh, grape that's going to be in front of it later. Don't ever be afraid to overlap. It makes the paint look so much better. If you don't uh, paint in an overlapping fashion, it looks as though uh, the picture is a colored drawing rather than a painting. And now, the, the bottle so far looks naked. It doesn't look as though it has its, its, its clothing on on the front. Well, that'll come later. I do have to take a smaller brush and work out the complication of the top. And I surely would never let these come on the same plane. I'd have to have it taller. Well, there's a little ceramic stopper. That ceramic stopper has a shadow. Remember, the light is coming from the left. So any non-reflective object, such as this ceramic stopper, is going to have a light side. That's the left side and the dark side, which is the right side. That's the shadow side. Would you believe that this little <coughs> rubber has light and dark? <laughs> All non-reflective has a light side and the dark side. Not true with reflective. They really are a mass tone with capricious reflections, depending on the environment they're in. Very often, light over here on the shadow side, because the light can pass through its transparency. You'll notice that I have a brush with a beautiful chisel-like end. And because I didn't have the outline there, I can make the outline with brush strokes, giving that painty look. This has a little bit of a dark interrupting it. And now I can introduce a little bit more feeling of green taking away the background color. And so that's as much as I feel as though I need to do on the bottle at this stage. It is at the same stage of development as this. And I have to now go on to the rest of them and carry the, the development of the picture just to that stage so that the picture matures uh, completely all at once. My next problem, or my next enjoyment, is to develop the grapes 
and uh, the apple that are in conjunction with the bottle. I think I'll do the grapes first. And so <clears throat> on my palate, as I said, my palate's my thinking place. If I'm going to have to do these grapes, I have to think about what's behind them. And as I look at these grapes, I see what's behind them, a lighter tone of the crock. I always police the area first, meaning see what the, how the surrounding area looks in relation to what I'm going to do. So I'm going to now actually lighten here before I start the grapes. And clean my brush in that big can of turpentine. And now grape color, green and yellow, phthalo yellow, green and yellow, yellow ochre. And I'll be able to now cut dramatically the shape of these grapes against that color. Painting is never filling in lines. It's making lines per stroke. I think constantly making decisions. If you like to make decisions and wrap one after another, paint. Shall I make that come in front of that now? Yes, why not? Shall I make another one come in front of it now? Why not? If I wanted to develop this section better, I would save those two grapes for later. But I'm going to not get involved with those grapes in the middle because I have on my mind right now the grapes silhouette. When the paint doesn't seem to cover easily, thin it with a little medium. There are shadow, big shadow areas on the grapes. I'm now adding the complementary color, red into the green or reddish violet. Not to shadowize every grape, but to help shadowize the, the, uh, the bunch, because I have a cluster coming forward. the difficult things about painting is that you always are looking at a finished product. You're seeing reality. And you think that you should get that reality right away. But you, you're not painting reality. You're painting an interpretation of reality. So even though I see a lot of things going on here, I know that I just want this cluster to come out, that to go back. Light makes it come forward. Dark makes it go back. And uh, it seems practical, and that's what I said, my painting technique is just reasonable and practical. It seems that rather than try to do this whole shape of these grapes as they meet the table, I should have the table in first because they're overlapping the table. So again, I'll save that for the next stage. Now the apple in front of the bottle it is also seen against the light table color. And I think I should put <clears throat> that in. Again, always look at the surrounding area and adjust it before you actually do it. Now this mixture is where I employed gray. I took black white first and mixed my yellow into it. And I'm going to overlap with that the outer periphery of the apple. I see a nice little shadow behind the apple here. Actually put that in too. This line 
from background to foreground in still life is, is a necessary evil. I hate to see it as a straight line because um, we deal so much with, with arced shapes that a straight line becomes so peculiar or almost more important. So I like to fake it and make it very nebulous. And now for the apple. <clears throat> when I mix the color, I'm going to mix the red that I see right up here. I'm going to take this uh, cadmium red light and Grimbacher red. I'm going to try it out. Hmm, nice. I've got to lighten it, though, and make it yellower. Yes. Now, I wipe the brush off, load it so that I can have the end of the brush record this shape back here. Every observation seems to demand a slight variation of the basic color to give it interest. Another reason why a palette is so important because it's, your colors are so close by. And I'm now developing the colors of the body tone. color is getting a little darker here, just before it falls into shadow. So now, darken the red, alizarin crimson and grimbacher red mixed together with its complementary green to reduce its intensity, look what happened here, to then paint in the shadow. If you want to fuse those colors, don't add, don't exert that much pressure on the brush. Of course, the brush has to be loaded. This is why there's a constant uh, uh, reference of your brush back to the palette. And just as I wanted the shadow side of the jug go back. I, I'm going to do the same thing here. I'm going to obliterate all this and make this a plain shadowed spot. Combining the body shadow with the cast shadow. The underpainting has enabled me not to have to paint too terribly thick, which gives me a chance to add a strange color on a strange color, meaning this bright green right on that red and have it show. Because actually that red is not that thick.
My hand is not educated to draw this. My mind is educated to draw this with paint because I know the anatomy of an apple. Going back to what I said before, this is a little inverted cone, so it gets light here and dark there. And I know that the apple is made of five sections, so I do this and this. I say if you want to do a good painting of an apple, buy two and eat one, see what the core looks like. So now I'm going to continue on to the other side of the composition. So again, since although since I have another apple to paint, I'm not going to clean my palette, but I am going to uh, take another broader view of the whole picture as it's progressing. This demonstration is about basic painting procedures and techniques. And this is my most reliable painting procedure and technique. You'll notice I have a little copper pot, very similar to the one that's in the composition. When I want to record anything, I try to analyze its, enti its entire shape in segments. I call them slices. Could you imagine this little copper pot as a loaf of bread sliced, standing on end, and you're uh, aware of each slice? Well, now let's examine each slice of this copper pot. It has a top slice, that's this plane, then it has a thickness, then it's on a little pedestal, then it is on a bigger, bigger pedestal, then it has this sloping section, then it has this line, another sloping section, then it has the fact that it is detached here. This is where it has its little spigot here. This just doesn't slope in, it comes down a little, then in and out, its fattest part comes in, down, and then a base. So we can almost say that it has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 slices. So if you look at something very carefully, uh, you then know it, and then your brush will be able to record it. I have been actually doing this as I have been painting these things. I started here at the apple, then came to the part that had the little indentation, and then did the front part. And so that's how I'm going to proceed to do this little copper pot. But before I do, I have to do the apple behind it. That apple has a very lost, vague line because it is partially in shadow. And with my ball stick to steady my hand, I'm going to ease it in gradually. And this is, I must get this apple in or painted in before I can proceed on the lovely little copper pitcher. Another basic reliable procedure would be to always put the more fragile colors in first. This apple is yellow and red, and I'm going to put the, the yellow part in first, again, bigger than it is, so that I could ease the more dominant color into it. You'll notice that there's always an action to the brush. And from the action of the brush, the paint, the paint results in a certain appearance. That's called rhythm of application. Really, any stroke will not do. The stroke has to be inspired by your observation. Not only your observation, but your analyzation of what you see. So we don't look and paint, we look, analyze, and paint.
Very important to have your rag close by to wipe the brush down when you feel as though it is too heavily saturated to affect a blend. I'm going to pull that apple in further than I think I need it to be able to now do the little copper pot. <clears throat> and starting from the top down, I'm going to do it a slice at a time. Two brushes, two nice brushes, and I'm going to mix up a general tone. And because metals have a magnificent highlight, I'm going to sculpt that object shape by its basic tone and its highlight. The tone that I see at the very top is the basic tone. The next slice is being affected by the highlight. This next slice is primarily the basic tone. And the highlight is here. Where do the highlights hit? Wherever the plane is directly in line with the light. This happens on any concave or convex plane in line with the light. Not in line with your point of view, in line with the light. It is appreciating the object shape in slices that will make you be able to draw better. I keep stressing that because people are always worried about the drawing. This makes it sensible. And sensible seems to mean, in painting, mean right. You don't want it to make it look realistic. You want to make it look plausible, recognizable in terms of paint. After all, I don't have a little copper pot on my brush. All I have are the tones and colors that I see on the copper pot. This slice comes down. An educated finger is always a handy thing to have. And now we have this dramatic highlight that hits on the concave plane and on the convex plane in line with the light. This is happening on this sloped form. to have these colors mush together. Years ago, when I studied as a child, my first art teacher said, painting is organizing successful accidents in rapid succession. Now I'm going to cut that shape off with the next plane down. And here I have another little highlight because it bumps out again. Put it in bigger than it is so I can ease it in. And now we're down to this plane, the down plane. And thus, the object seems to grow under your brush 
strokes. I can't really stop now. I see another slice, and that is its rolled base. Now the copper pot is done only in highlight and body tone. There are areas that are so much away from the source of light that they are actually in shadow. Of course, they're all going to be on the left. I mean, I'm sorry, on the right. Opposite from the source of light. Constantly be aware you're painting what the light does to the object, not what the object really is. That's a capricious dark. Odd that it's there. Shouldn't be on the light side, although reflective objects often get very dark things on the side toward the light. If you see something about the subject that you think is intriguing, put it in. Don't be too mechanical. There are reflections on that copper pot, too, that will be a great benefit. And I like to save reflections for later. Why don't I continue right along now, because and do the red apple. When an apple, when you see a color that looks as though it um, <clears throat> doesn't have white in it, then you can go reach the color first. As soon as you think that it, and you can always feel that it has white. So I'm going to take this red and put, take it down on a thing on my palette. Judge it, because I can look at it and look at this. I think I could even put a little alizarin in this to get this a richer red to start that. Yeah, like it. Use it. That's where the light strikes. Yes, the light can strike in the anatomy of its stem end. I'm going to put that in, and now I'm going to first, with a darker red, begin the shadow. And then, with the complement in that darker red, paint the shadow. This procedure and use of color is an analysis of the principles of nature. I didn't invent them. I just am aware of the nature of nature and use nature's characteristic in my painting to get that natural look. And you could see now that there would be a real necessity to, to just stop a minute, because I'm going to be drastically putting yellow against brilliant red. Look at the complication of shape I have to encounter and deal with. The slice is against the apple, and then the half a lemon is also against the apple, and the slice is behind the lemon. And this very often seems as though it can never be recorded in paint, and yet these reliable painting principles and reliable painting techniques will uh, be able to manage that complication. And now over to the canvas. I'm going to wipe away some of that red first. 
And now with a loaded brush, the paint right on the end of the brush, I'm going to put the shape of the light of the membrane right against the apple. I really don't care how thick, it's going into shadow here, how thick this shape becomes, meaning thick from top down. because I can shape it in with the next tone down. Cutting it down to size. That stroke could go down very far. I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in this. We then have the meat of the lemon in shadow. Remember, all these mixtures are in that pamphlet. that further down. Purposely further down. So that I can make a nice swipe with the brush to cut it off. off. It makes a neat application. And then that can be cut off with the rest of the, oops, that's the wrong color, greener. Little color back into the shadow. And now I'm ready to cut the half a lemon against what is already there. You can see how important it is to overlap. So now I have the meat here. Again, ignoring how thick that is being painted because I'm going to cut it down with the next tone and shape. I see the light membrane coming right at me. Make this down further than I want it so that I can make an immaculately shaped lighter me membrane in front of it. The brush was never really meant to make skinny little lines. You have to figure out a way to make skinny little lines, especially light ones. Now this is the light side, darker just before it turns into shadow. And now the shadow is going to cut that in front of that slice. Then the whole bottom of both of those shapes are going to be cut down to size with the all-important cast shadow.
Now, doesn't that seem like a practical, logical, and easy way to deal with that part of this picture. Racing right along. Let's see how the putting in the all over table tone will affect the appearance. See how colorful all this is. And this gray is so colorless, which proves that you can never paint anything with just black and white. It has to have color imparted into it. And so this white tablecloth has color in it. Yellowish in this case. Another opportunity to fix shapes. I want to do a better job of that cast shadow, so I'm going to cut into it and with paint so I can shape into it. And here again, remember I said the these grapes shapes should come over the table cloth. And all this back in here, since now this is in the yellowish uh, off-white family, the shadow is violet. The complementary color to yellow. Light is made of three colors, yellow, red, and blue. You have to use yellow, red, and blue to record the effect of light. So when you're painting something yellow, you have to use violet, the combination of red and blue. Why? Because that's the very nature of nature. You want your pictures to look natural, you will have to abide by nature's law. I do this because I want to follow through. And this ends the, well, no, let me fix, let me fix the shape of this shadow here. And let me fix the shape of these shadows here. And again, on the bunch of grapes, this shadow here and have the shadow conform to what's causing it. I have a beautiful lighting effect in that the light is passing in back of those grapes, right there. Wish I could get the color I want. Maybe that's better. Since this program or this demonstration is primarily on basic painting techniques, I haven't talked about composition. That will come at another time. But I'm suggested to, or my what I'm doing now suggests me mentioning it that the all important factor of composition is a focal point, which can be very much established by having a tremendous amount of contrast in one place. And so we, oops. There's lots of oopses in painting. I 
say oops a lot. And now we're at the end of, let's say, the second stage. I had the planning stage, the underpainting, and now I have developed all the objects to a point that I can further develop them with the strong accents of light. What I'm going to do to each one of these objects, uh, starting out with the jug, seems to be what uh, the beginner painter wants to start with. And here, I've saved all this for last because it is the very extraordinary, lovely things about each thing. Starting with the jug, I see a highlight, that all-important tone value, and it hits. Here, that's a little con convex plane, here's a concave plane, and here's a great big convex plane. I see one here and here too. Well, I can't leave them like that. I just painted them in so that I can then make them do their, their job, and I'm going to ease them in with lighter, brighter colors of the, pot, the crock itself. Lighter and lighter on the light side is what I do to further develop the appearance of my subject. And conversely, darker and darker on the dark side. I not only improve the texture of the object, but I also accentuate the object's dimension. Sable brushes to do this st stage because you're painting paint onto paint. So you don't want too much resistance. And now, this is already dark. I'm going to go darker to show that little hole where the handle wire is fitting in. Darker there. And if I were not showing you how I go about this, I would wait for this pot to be dry before I'd actually put this handle in. But if I want the appearance of the picture to be as they call loose, I wouldn't wait for it to dry. I'd flip it in with just a few simple strokes. Sometimes that's kind of the charm of the picture, the rhythm of application in which it was painted, casually rather than carefully. Depends on how much time you have and the mood you're in. But I like to say, I don't know whether you know what I mean when I say it, trifle with trifles. Pay attention to a structure which is more important. Oops, that was dumb. I took away the plane 
of the top. Try, trying to put a feeling of a, a funny little cork in there. It's at this point that I would inspect the turning edge and add a reflection if I wanted it. That means a little lighter tone in the shadow. That's optional. I made it reddish because of the redness of the composition here. Now let's go on to the finishing of the glass bottle. You can see that I have it in, but it doesn't look as though it has a front. The front is going to happen because of the highlights, white with a touch of green's complement red. And these are going to hit my brush loaded. See, I'm going to pop one here, in for the concave, out for the convex, in for the concave. I'm going to skip along here because I don't see it until this concavity and this convexity. Ease it in, up at the top again. The highlight seems to dissipate into a brighter version of the color of the glass itself on the side away from the light. And I see some very lovely reflections. They can never be as light as the highlight. No tone value on a, on, a, on a subject can be lighter than the highlight. Highlight means the highest light. And now if I slide green over this, the liquid bec will come, become in back of the glass. The grapes. Just as I add lighter light to bring out the, the dimension of the crock, which is non-reflective, grapes are also non-reflective, I'm going to make them come out by adding lighter too. I see this one lighter. I see this one lighter. That one lighter. This one is extraordinarily light right here. Cutting right into that dark shape. And these cut in light against the table tone. 
these have to remain kind of dark because they silhouette against the bottle. So from tone values that somewhat contrast each other, I then make them more contrasting, more light to the light and more dark to the dark. Then the picture is consistently painted in the same manner which ties it together. Do you know that a mistake is just a funny, just a place that's different? It can be a beautiful, I can, if I paint one grape magnificently, I have to do them all that way. But if I suggest each one to be grapes, then I'll be able to get away with recording the whole bunch. I have a philosophy of, that backs me up in my painting to keep me free and keep me from losing my mind, and that is that if I make it all wrong, it's all right. And using the same procedure on everything does give it a unity, a harmony of mistakes or a harmony of success, depending on the luck you had that day. It would be so nice to have more time to show you some of these things. But a demonstration shows the reliable painting principles that I use when I do have more time. Darker and darker, lighter and lighter. And they start to come forward. How about some strategic highlights on those two? Here, 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 here. Don't highlight all of them. Just the ones that you know that are in direct line with the light. And these highlights vary as to where they are on each one. They're not in the middle. They vary according to the particular view of the grape that you have. I need desperately a darker tone here. To make that grape come forward. So why don't I sacrifice it and put it in again? The apple needs a highlight to make it shine. Here's another basic painting procedure that I use. I put something on in one direction that way to make the apple look as though it does this and influence it opposite from that way. And now, why don't we just rest a minute before we develop these in the same fashion that I did uh, that section of the composition. I'd like to show you how <clears throat> I mix my color colors, uh, in this case the highlight on that apple. I pick up white, since I'm adding a lighter value, and I plop it down on my palette Already my brush is not loaded quite right, so I wipe it off. Also, wiping it off doesn't contaminate the color that I'm going to go into. And I'm going to go into a little touch of violet, move it here, and then mix it together. Very, just quickly, 
Now the brush is loaded incorrectly again. I have to wipe it again. So that I can then take this and pick it up on the end of my brush. So that the end of the brush is loaded so I can come over to the canvas, aim it to where the highlight is and stroke it on. Yes, I put more than I want, so I can ease it in. To put that highlight on and not ease it in makes it look as though you had a chicken with a highlight foot walk across the canvas. If a highlight looks like just a piece of paint, it's not a successful highlight. If the highlight makes the object look as though it shines, it is a successful highlight. Yeah, this is the time that you do have a chance to diddle around. And if once you've done it, it doesn't look right, take it off and do it again. automatically, maybe I could darken this little shadow here. That helped. Now on to the copper pot. You'll notice that I have on the copper pot highlight, body tone, body shadow. And now I'd like to put in the tone value that happens to metals, and that is the reflection. And I see a lovely pinkish one here. And here. And sliding up in here because this is where it's catching light from the light tablecloth. That is also happening on this under plane because the light can, it's in line with that under plane. And as bright as I have the, high, uh, the copper looking now, I'd like to move that highlight area down a little bit. I can still go lighter. If I do what I said I did before, I take a lot of white, I move it down onto the palette, wipe my brush, put the color into it, orange, and red, and this I'm going to quickly mix. Not mix it a lot. A quick, vibrant mix. Wipe the brush, pick that vibrant mixture up on the brush, come over to the canvas. I have a lot of paint on the end of my brush, and I'm just going to lay lighter color right in the center of the already existing highlight. Don't ever be afraid to paint shiny things too shiny. You can always tarnish it <laughs> by blending the highlight in. And this, of course, has a handle, too. Just 
just make some structures as to where it's going to go before you connect them. This apple now looks dark in relation to how light I made the copper pot. And so it has to be light. And now I feel as though, again, I'll take white, find a place, mix red in. That's too red. Oranger. Now I'm going to move that paint over to the copper pot. I'm not the copper pot. Heavens, I'm working on the apple. And see what it'll do. Oh, yes, that makes the illumination the same. Very important to make your illumination consistent. And a highlight. That didn't work because I didn't clean my brush from red to highlight. little can be done to this complicated area in here. But I could lighten the color of the lemon right there. Or I could what I call rhythmatize. Just make some strokes to show the texture. Here too, this goes down. Yes, and I actually see a shine happening. <clears throat> Try to do each stage as nicely as possible because a picture that has to be have a lot of correction starts to look overworked and it suffers from its overwork. Now when we look at this over this whole picture more broadly you can see that I have a lot of contrasts that come as a result of the light coming from the left and also that the light is coming not only from the left but from above. Thus the table plane has to be lighter to be consistent with the lighting on the subject. And so with a big gob of white, a little bit of yellow, let the light slap the top plane, the flat plane, and putting it on in a way that is suggested by the folds, the basic value that I started out with becomes the little shadows of the folds. You'll notice I'm starting all the lighter tones on the table at the subject matter, not down here not away from the composition. I want these things to evolve from the subject. One mark down here is just becomes a, something out of um, the focal area. It has to be connected. could stand a little bit more light over there, maybe a little bit more light over there, and juice the paint, wet the brush a little bit just to ease that action down away. Much of what I've done on this picture is repetitious 
because I did. I used the same techniques throughout. Let's review. I start from the top down, usually. I make a light side and a dark side on all non-reflective objects, the jug, the apples, and the, and the uh, grapes. Reflective objects, I let the highlight do the demanding work of showing its dimension. I cut one shape down with the next shape so that the image seems to grow under my brush. Yes, there's lots of things I could do to this. I put this little thing in here and maybe soften some things and lighten some things. For instance, I might want this handle to be a little darker, make it show up a little bit more accentuate its cast shadow from that. I don't like the way this um, little pot is encountering the apple. But you could, at this point, tickle it to death. About two hours have passed, I hope as interestingly to you as it has been for me. Uh, they say that a professional is someone who knows when to stop. I really have no place to go anymore. I've used my army of tones, all the lights and darks, and I've rec recorded all the shapes. So the only thing I have left to do is to say thank you for watching. Thank you.